The year of the Linux desktop. We keep saying every year, this is going to be our year, right? At least for 10 to 15 years now, we have been expecting Linux to finally gain recognition from the masses and climb its way to being the dominant desktop operating system. That's never happened. Uh, Linux has never gained traction on the desktop. Why? That's our topic for the day. So let's get into the heart of the matter here. So why Linux never gained traction on the desktop? Well, we've had some growth over the years. I've been using Linux as my primary desktop operating system for 10 years now. Uh, had some experience with Linux before making the full time switch to Linux. And, you know, when I first started using Linux as my daily desktop operating system, it was understood that we probably had less than 1% of the desktop market share. Now, recent studies in the last few months, uh, some of them put us in the 25 to even 3% desktop market share range. So we have had some growth over the years. That's actually pretty considerable growth when you think about it. But clearly, we're not ever going to be the dominant desktop platform. So where did we go wrong? Well, I made the slideshow with five reasons why I think Linux failed on the desktop. Uh, point one is Windows and Mac offer familiarity. Windows and Mac are familiar to their users and they are, they're also easier to use in many regards. If you've used Windows and Mac, you've probably used Windows and Mac for years, right? If you were a Windows user now, you've probably always been a Windows user your whole life. Same thing with Mac for the most part. And change is hard, right? Uh, it's hard to, con to convince your average computer user to change operating systems um, because, again, change is difficult. They know how to use Windows and Mac. You're going to have to teach them a brand new workflow when they move to Linux. Uh, even though many Linux tasks are easier, they're going to be foreign to the brand new user. Windows and Mac users, they're used to the same workflow they used for years, but in Linux, everything's different, right? Plus, we have so many distros with so many desktop environments, all very different from each other. There's no standard in Linux. Uh, nothing is standardized in Linux. With Windows and Mac, you are presented with your operating system, and there's not much you can do to change it. It is as is, but you know what? As is, Windows and Mac are pretty good operating systems, especially for your average computer user. They're kind of locked down for the geek, for the enthusiast. You know, Linux may be a better platform, but, you know, for 95% plus of the population on planet Earth, Windows and Mac is just easier to use. Uh, many Linux distros, quite frankly, have steep learning curves, much steeper learning curves in some cases than Windows and Mac. So I'm talking about distros like Arch, Gen2, NixOS, Void, etc., etc. Much, much steeper learning curve to distros like that then using a operating system like Windows and Mac. Even the really, really new user-friendly distros, Ubuntu, Elementary, SUSE, uh, there's still a learning curve to those. Even though they're easy to install, you still have to live in them, right? After the installation is done. And for, you know, the average person, I'm thinking, you know, those of you that have grandparents, you know, the elderly, uh, they're not going to be happy. <laughs> on a brand new operating system you know they just want to use what they've always been using and what they've always been using unfortunately windows and mac point number two why linux failed on the desktop is less software is available in linux um, why well because linux has such a small desktop market share supply and demand right so there's less of us there's less programs available for us uh, fewer companies make programs desktop programs for us now, free and open source software is filling in the gaps. We have some really shining examples of free and open source software, but there's still some glaring holes to fill as far as software availability. Probably the biggest one that we've overcome, to some extent, was games. When I first started as a Linux desktop user, we had like zero games available on Linux. I mean, we had a few, 
Quake-based first-person shooters, and we had Super Tux. Other than that, we had no games. I'm talking zero games for Linux. Now, about four or five years ago, Steam started making a Linux client, and that has brought uh, something like uh, 2,000 games or so to Linux now. I'm, I'm not sure the number right offhand, but we have a lot of games now available on Linux that we didn't when I first started. But still, a lot of the AAA titles are still Windows and Mac, or oftentimes just Windows only. So if you're a serious gamer, unfortunately, you still have to use Windows. Uh, that's just the reality of it. Other glaring holes to fill as far as software, the Office Suite, and of course I'm talking about the Microsoft Office Suite, is still a big hurdle for a lot of people. They have to use Microsoft Office for their work or for school. We have LibreOffice, but LibreOffice is not Microsoft Office. Uh, the Adobe suite of products. Adobe does not support Linux for the most part. Um, we're never going to get an Adobe Photoshop available on Linux. It's just not going to happen. Um, CAD programs is another uh, weak spot for us. Professional multimedia programs is a weak spot for us. So less software available in Linux. That is one of the things that really held us back as far as Linux gaining traction on the desktop. Point number three, Linux is just too bleeding edge for your typical computer user. Well, what am I talking about bleeding edge? I'm talking about constantly introducing brand new technology, uh, often before it's ready, often before it's stable. So I'm thinking, for those of you that remember back in the day when GNOME 2 switched to GNOME 3, GNOME 3 was not ready. It was nowhere close to being stable, and it was absolutely nothing like the previous edition of GNOME completely different workflow, uh, that's pretty bleeding edge. <laughs> the same thing, the move from KDE 3 to KDE 4, uh, that's, that's a tough one to sell users, uh, but this is standard in Linux. We make these kinds of big changes all the time to our users. Uh, Windows and Mac, they never do anything like this. Same thing with going from uh, also to Pulse Audio, or now with Xorg to Wayland. Uh, we change init systems all the time, although usually that goes pretty smoothly because nobody ever really sees the init system. But we're, we're very much bleeding edge, much more bleeding edge compared to Windows and Mac. Also, more and more Linux distros are using rolling release or pseudo rolling release models where all or close to all of the packages on your system are being updated. The more packages being updated, the more potential for breakage, of course. In Windows and Mac, who is responsible for fixing your system, you know, if things go wrong? Well, you paid for Windows and Mac, right? You bought that from a company that is supposed to support you. Who is responsible for fixing your problems in Linux? Ultimately, you are. That's a problem. Point number four, why Linux failed on the desktop. The Linux community can be toxic at times. Now, I made a video about the Linux community being toxic a few months back, so those of you that want more in-depth on this point, see my previous video on this topic, but very briefly, I will say that sometimes we, the Linux community, we do not treat our new Linux users with respect. They go to forums, IRC chat channels, whatnot, and ask for help for whatever problems they're having on their Linux distro, and sometimes... We are mean to them, we belittle them, we tell them to go read the effing manual, etc, etc. So, as a community, we could do a much better job how we treat new to Linux users. Also, there's too much bickering in the free and open source software community. We uh, love to argue over things like, well, I mentioned the init system, over things like sysv versus upstart versus systemd. Or, uh... You know, also versus Pulse Audio. What's other things we, we love to bicker about? We're constantly uh, packaging. We love to bicker about you know, RPM versus Dib, or nowadays Snap Pack versus Flat Pack versus App Image. Uh, there's always an argument going on. <laughs> Look at any free and open source software channel of any kind, and you will see bickering. And to those on the outside looking in, it looks like all we do sometimes is argue. Uh, also, too many cooks spoils the broth. With free and open source software, of course, anybody can contribute. We're all free to, to contribute to a project and make changes. 
too many cooks spoils the broth. You've heard that old saying where, you know, these companies like Microsoft and Apple creating their operating systems. Uh, basically, there's one chief leading the whole thing, uh, the CEOs of those com companies. Um, and in a lot of ways, they have much clearer visions of where they're going than what we as a open source community have for our projects. And my fifth and final point of why Linux failed on the desktop is we just, we missed too many opportunities. There were too many missed opportunities along the way. The biggest one, the biggest one was Windows Vista. When XP, when Windows XP and then we had Windows Vista after XP, Windows Vista was badly received by the public. It was complete and total garbage. And at the time, Ubuntu was really coming becoming big on the scene and ubuntu with gnome 2 the gnome 2 desktop at the time plus the compiz window manager with the cube effects and exploding windows and wobbly windows and all that ubuntu was fantastic and if we were ever going to succeed on the desktop it was going to be at that time windows vista when windows was arguably at one of its low points in its history and linux on the desktop was just doing great things. It was, if you showed Windows Vista side by side, some of those versions of Ubuntu with the GNOME 2 and Compiz back then, no one would have wanted to use Vista. I mean, it was, it was that glaring of a difference, how good Ubuntu was compared to Windows Vista, but the public never received that message. Why? Nobody tried to market Ubuntu or Linux in general to the public because it takes money, right? It takes a significant amount of money to market something like that. And back then, there were no large Linux corporations interested in the desktop market share. Only Canonical, and Canonical was not a profitable company back then. Uh, Red Hat and SUSE were around, but they were making all their money in the server market. They were not interested in desktop at all. So we made very little gains during the Windows Vista era. Uh, even today, you know, looking back, you know, 10 years ahead, fast forward, you know, the recent versions of Ubuntu are so much better than Ubuntu back then. Same thing with things like SUSE, Elementary, Fedora, uh, some of these Arch-based distros even. You know, I get, guys, I love Manjaro. Manjaro's fantastic. But you know what? Even today, Linux is still too geeky and obscure of an operating system for the average user. It's still not as user-friendly out of the box as Windows and Mac. Part of the problem is the community, right? 99% of Linux distros are community-based distros, right? They're not backed by a large corporation that's funding it. Uh, the community is building these distros, and we, as a community, have never really aimed to make Linux more popular. As a community, we don't care if Linux is the dominant desktop operating system. All the community aims to do is make Linux better for our community. We're not really trying to expand the community, unfortunately. Not the way is needed to make this the dominant desktop operating system, which I don't think it will ever be. Uh, that's my five reasons why I think Linux has failed on the desktop. Before I go, I do have to give a special thanks to my patrons. And I'm talking about A.K. Allen, Alex, Ansem, Tony, Bart, Benjamin, Ben, Bruno, Brian, Carlos, Christian, Chuck, Dan, the other Dan, da Daniel, David, the other David, Eduardo, Greg, you made Interceptor, Jake, John, Carl, Katrina, Keith, Lee, or Marcus, the other Marcus, Mark, Martin, Matthias, Michael, Mr. GFY, Mr. Smarty Pants, Mr. Neely Pops, Paul, Rob, Robert, Ron, Silvio, First Stephen, Second Stephen, Third Stephen, Swami, Tiedemann, Voice Lob, Tubella, and John. You guys rock. You guys help make this show possible. Peace, guys. Thank <laughs> you.